offend some people, so I want to say he's uh, he's, a, he's in a first place tie at a minimum. Mm. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> to the serious point, he's uh, uh, you know, for, for uh, among a, from uh, the American board of folks is uh, is a profoundly important scholar in this work. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. Uh, Jim and everyone who's organized the conference, uh, it's uh, really an honor to be here and uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to input and, and really to carrying through with this exciting uh, uh, endeavor you guys have embarked on. Um, uh, I'm going to, it was, you know, Lee Sher, uh, uh, Gao Wall uh, had a really good talk and I think it sort of set up especially both of the comments. Um, talking about uh, human capital roots of China's inequality, and I'm going really, to look at uh, education, nutrition, health. This is uh, a body of work that I'm going to be talking about that's being uh, presented uh, based on work done with a lot, a lot of colleagues. A whole bunch of them are back there. Uh, they're the guys that do the hard, hard work. Almost all of it is primary data um, uh, that we've collected over the last few years. I'm going to do two things today. I, I debated back and forth about this, and I wasn't sure what the audience, so I'm, I, I'll try to get through the first part first. I'm going to tell a story first, and this is just a story that I want to tell about growth and development and inequality, uh, mainly human capital inequality. Uh, I'll have a few numbers with it, too. Uh, I, I wouldn't take this as causal evidence. Um, and, and I'm going to show why I think that we really should take inequality seriously. I, I think it's a big, big problem. Um, and when you get done hearing the story, uh, what I want you to ask yourself is, is this possible to happen in China? And then maybe put a, uh, put a probability on it. Like there's a 30% probability that this possibly could happen, or 10% uh, uh, that, that this could happen. And then, then you want to ask the question, uh, is it worth investing in to try to overcome this problem? Uh, so even make it as an insurance investment. You don't even think it, but it, as an insurance policy, should we invest in overcoming this inequality? So I, I, I'm going to tell a story, try to do it really quick, because I want to get to the, the, the heart of the, the paper, which is about human capital inequality in China, uh, and really think about all these long-term uh, uh, dynamics that, that you guys talked about. So here's the story. Uh, we all know why almost everything in the 90s and the 2000s uh, were, that the world makes was manufactured here. In, in fact, very interestingly, I was at, at New Year's, Chinese New Year's, Hong Bing Li took his daughter to uh, Stanford and spent a week there, and they had a shopping list this long, because things in America are cheaper. Um, <laughs> and the basket was piled full of stuff, right? And I'm waiting there, a little bored. And, waiting. and so I start looking at where everything's made, and almost nothing in their basket was made in China. Um, uh, it was made all over the rest of the world. Um, and, and so, but this is the 80s and the 90s, right? It's because China's low wage was so low. Of course, it's not always like this. If mm, people who are older, my age, remember when most everything in the world was made in South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, and Mexico. Uh, at those times, wages, for example, in South Korea was 75 cents an hour. Um, uh, of course, it just didn't last long, right? Uh, today, the wage in Korea is $14 an hour, unskilled wage. It, it rose very, very fast. And um, a transformation took place in South Korea uh, that I think facilitated this move when they went from a low-wage economy to a high-productivity, service-based, innovative-based economy that it is today. The same workers... The same workers who were producing the low-wage manufactured goods in 1980 were high-skilled, high-paid uh, workers in 2000. Why did this change? So how did this take place? Well, in no small part, even in the early 1980s, this is the early data as I can get from South Korea, is that every single South Korean went to high school. Every single South Korean went to high school. Back when wages were 75 cents an hour. Today in China, wages are $2 an hour. I'm going to get to that. Today in China, not everyone goes to high school. But, but at that time, everyone went to high school, and this helped facilitate that transformation. 
Not all countries in the world, though, have made the transformation from middle income to rich income as smoothly as South Korea. How about Mexico? In the 1970s and 80s, yeah, Mexico was up and down, but it was a country that was growing and there was great hope. Manufacturing was growing. It had very low wages. Then by the mid-1990s, wages actually hit $4 an hour in Mexico. It looked like Mexico was on a path to become a developed country. As would expected at that time, all low-wage manufacturing left Mexico. Where did it come? It came here in, 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 in the 1990s. But Mexican economists said, that's okay, that's what we want. We want to replace those low-wage manufacturing with high-skilled, service-based, high-wage jobs. And, but Mexico's education system wasn't like South Korea's. This is what Mexico's education in the 80s, back when they were educating the people who were in the workforce in the 90s and early 2000s. Uh, only about 40% of rural and poor urban Mexicans went to high school and had the skills that were needed in this new labor market. Then came the peso crisis, I'm thinking renminbi crisis of uh, 2024, but it was the peso crisis of 1994. 15 to 20 percent of Mexicans lost their job. About 10 million Mexicans were laid off. Most of them were never hired again because as firms restructured in Mexico, uh, uh, they with the high wages, they substituted low skill wage for high skill uh, for uh, with capital and and other forms of um, uh, 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 of investments. And there was a chronic unemployed a part of the Mexican economy. About 15 to 20 percent of it was permanently uh, segmented out of the formal labor market. In Mexico, they had three choices. One, they came to the United States. Uh, we put up a border. We have more soldiers on the Mexican-U.S. border than we have in Afghanistan and Iraq combined now, just to keep the Mexican uh, laborers out. Two, they wanted the informal economy. So they, they did, they, they were uh, without benefits, without wages, just subsistence uh, in, in from Three, they joined organized crime. And Mexico today is a country in the middle of a huge violence. Uh, more Mexicans have been killed in violence in the past five years than in the Vietnam War from the, the, the U.S. spot, uh, uh, on the U.S. side. So it's, it's, it's a country in crisis. Foreign direct investment is falling. Uh, I think it has a lot to do with human capital inequality. So this motivates a more fundamental question. Is it inevitable that developing countries that are growing fast and achieve middle income status will always continue to become a rich industrialized nation? In fact, you, know, you guys know the answer to that. Um, Argentina was one of the richest countries in the world in the early 20th century collapsed and stagnated after World War II. Uruguay, Iraq, Venezuela, uh, more recently Mexico, etc. Uh, so there's lots and lots of examples. So I, I've taken sort of um, uh, uh, grouped some countries together I think that we want to think about this. And here I've tried to put up every country that I can think of. It's not a very long list that went from middle income to high income since World War II. So uh, you know, don't take the recovering economies of Japan or North Europe. Uh, uh, but, but these are, it's, you know, it's a very short list. Uh, and you can see these are the countries that are now high in income OECD countries and regions, right? Um, uh, including Taiwan. Uh, and um, the thing is, is, look at their inequality rates. Everyone has genie less than 40, okay? Every single one of these countries had growth with equity, okay? Uh, this doesn't prove anything, <laughs> okay? But it's saying, it's just a fact, is that every single country that was successful to move up had very low Gini rates. Now let's look at the aspirees. So these are the middle-income countries of the world who want to become rich industrialized countries, okay, including China. Um, look, at, look at those genies. Every single one of them is above 40. Okay. Many of them, as, as Leisher said, many of them are above 50. All right. And of course, as we saw today, the average aspirees is 47. 
China's almost 50, it was rising through 2007. Every time you go to Leisure's paper, a talk, he's written three more papers. Uh, and and so, I, it's, so I'd say it's 50 and it, it's between 45, 50 and stagnant. I actually think it's very interesting that it's coming down now. Though I, have, I often, you know, I think Lee Gunn's paper has to be taken very seriously. Uh, is this 61? Um, uh, or, I mean, I, I think it's, it's extremely important to do that. So the stories of Mexico and Korea provide the backdrop for interpreting what's happening in China today and where China is headed. While low wages and labor-intensive manufacturing fueled economic growth in the 80s and 90s, China today, like Korea and Mexico early, is entering a new era. Right? We, we saw the, uh, uh, Zhao Zhong already put them on there. Uh, the, these extremely rising, uh, fast rising wage rates, up to $2 an hour now, uh, and, uh, and, and rising faster than GDP. China, where is it going, is if, assuming China continues to grow, there's going to be rising demand. Uh, we know the, demogra uh, the um, demographic dividend is gone. We're going to have falling supply. Uh, that the, the World Bank projects by 2025 to 2030, wages are going to be six, uh, the unskilled wages is going to be six to ten dollars an hour okay, in, in China and within the next um, uh, 10 to 15 years. Of course, what that's going to mean is industrial structure. So these scenes that are like this are going to be gone. And of course, they're already disappearing very, very fast. Um, this is from Hong Bing Li in his paper in Journal of Economic Perspectives, where we follow wages in Asia. China now has the seventh highest wage in Asia. Uh, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, Malaysia, and China. China is now seventh in that. And rising, I think they'll take over Malaysia quite quickly. Um, and, and so, you know, how expensive you know, are these workers? So, with China's wages higher, can China move up the productivity ladder? Uh, here's a textile worker in a Gucci shoe factory in Portugal. All right? um, he makes shoes. He's going to make shoes in a high-wage economy. To do his job, he needs to know math, language, English, and computers. <laughs> and he makes 11 euros an hour. Right? That's, that's how we can make the 11 years out. Here are textile workers in China. We just did a survey of textile workers in China uh, a while back. Most of these women can't read or write. Right? They don't know how to read or write. How are they going to be able to do that job? Uh, here's my mechanic in Palo Alto. <laughs> okay? This is my mechanic. There's my car back there. It broke down. <laughs> He's fixing my car with a computer. He then ordered my parts on the internet, and then he, he did all the process, all the billing. That's how Manuel, uh, he saves my life, that's how Manuel has $13.50 an hour. Okay? That's why he's worked 15 cents, but he obviously knows computer. Here are students in a jurgal and a, v, a vocational ed program in China studying auto mechanics. Not one of these guys has ever touched a computer. Most of them don't even know what the internet is. How are they going to be able to pay $13.50 an hour when China's wage goes up? So the real challenge is coming, right? Can China transform itself like South Korea, Spain, New Zealand, or will it become a Mexico or an Argentina of the, of the 50s, 60s, and 70s? Uh, you know, sort of, this is sort of what I think. So what's the problem? It has a lot to do with slowing growth. So we talk a lot about inequality rising, topping out. What's going to be happening to growth over the next 20 years is we know, right? Growth is going to slow, all right? And as it slows, in, in the face of high inequality, there's questions about the stability of a country. Can all individuals share in the prosperity? You know, how can China have such high, pro high inequality, yet everything's so stable and, and safe and crime is so low. That's because exactly what Yao Hui said is everybody shared in this rising, <laughs> in the growth. But what happens when that growth stalls or, or slows further? Uh, the key question is going to be when, what's China's inequality? It's not, and, and of course everybody is sort of doing that now, it's not what China's inequality is today, it's what China's inequality is going to be 2030. Right? That's what we sort of really want to care about. It's high now. You know, is that going to continue? And to examine, but of course we've been thinking that it's about this long-term inequality. 
And so, um, this is this is taking words from you, who is taking words from him. Uh, what is inequality tomorrow? Well, it's inequality today, and it's human inequality um, uh, today. That's going to create what the inequality for tomorrow is going to be. And we know today it's very, very high. Um, so what I want to talk about today is how high is human capital inequality? We haven't really, really addressed that. And that's what one of the things Yahweh said that we really want to try to address. It. I want to look at it in terms of education, health, and nutrition. So not just education. Um, and then that's going to determine what inequality is going to be tomorrow. So in short, today's human capital inequality among children is one of the strongest determinants of tomorrow's income inequality. Are workers today going to employable tomorrow, or are kids in school today who are going to be workers tomorrow going to be employed? Well, that's also uh, uh, what we're interested in. So the rest of the presentation is how equal are China's education skills, how equal are China's nutrition balance, and how equal are health outcomes. Um, uh, it, uh, we're going to look at a little of this. Now, how I'm going to cut this, it's sort of regional, but um, I, I, I want to look at not just, I think we lose a lot in your analysis by looking at rural and urban. There's really three Chinas. There's three Chinas. There's urban, right? There's other rural along this coast, and then there's poor rural. And I take that as poor, uh, officially poor counties, and then the uh, rural counties of central China. I think that they all should be, be, be put in there. Um, and even though it's only about 30 to 35 percent of the population, it's actually 45 percent of five-year-olds, kids in starting school, 45 percent of five-year-olds are in these areas. Okay, So this is, this is half of China's future labor force. I have 80 million kids between 6 to 15. If we then go down below below 6, uh, there are 100, we're talking about, there's 100 million kids in, in these poor rural areas right now that between the ages of 1 and 15, right? And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at education system and throw in some nutrition and health <laughs> along the way, and I'm going to look at it sort of backwards, start at college and work backwards, okay? Um, I thought that fantastic. Look at those rates of returns that, that you put up there. Forty-five percent for college. I mean, just wow. That's why everybody wants to go to college. Okay. So let's look at: Do poor have access to college? And if you look at a hundred rural kids from these poor rural areas and a hundred urban kids, there's eight times more chance that an urban kid will go to any college. This includes. Uh, uh, Dajuan, this includes uh, uh, this includes these vocational colleges, three-year vo junior colleges, I think you call them. So it's eight times more. Um, eight out of ten, uh, eight out of a hundred rural kids. So ninety-two out of hundred rural kids will never go to college, or have never gone to college. It's fifteen to one. Oops, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, fifteen to one for uh, sorry, fifteen to one for four-year colleges. And it's 21 to 1 for elite colleges. Okay, so there's in, that's you know there's 21 more chances of a of an urban kid going to an elite college, a uh, er yao yao, so a 211 college, <laughs> than for a, a poor rural kids. Okay, so so it's it, extreme uh, inequality. So here's the extreme extreme of inequality. Do you know how many? poor rural female minorities are at Peking University in Tsinghua. <laughs> yes, yeah, there's seven of them. Seven of them, and five of them were baosong, <laughs> into pharmacy, into Chinese medicine major. And there's only two in any of the rest of the majors. So, um, uh, th this is sort of the extreme uh, uh, unequalness. What's the population? Find four rural minority. So it's all uh, the population, the shared population. Shared population. So it's uh, I I don't know the exact. Um, the, so it's forty five percent who are well, in poor rural. rural. That's poor rural. So forty five percent of poor rural. Uh, half of that is women, okay. girls, and then 
probably a third of that or 20 percent of that is is minority yeah yeah or or 10 percent right so it's uh, uh that's their population sure so they have a a hundred to one difference a hundred to one difference for um a, a urban woman going to college versus a poor rural minority going to college a hundred to one so to, so um so, okay, that, 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 that's that's sort of going the extreme. Well, all kids, that, and that's not even the point of of the, sort of the set this up. I don't think all kids need to go to college. If you're in if you're in Taiwan or South Korea today, the biggest issue is there's too many college kids, right? Everyone goes to college. Um, you know, be a nice problem to have in China. I, as we did in our discussion, I don't think every kid needs to go to college, but I think that every kid needs to go to high school. Um, to get the skills, math, science, ICT, language, and English abilities. But today, only 40% of junior high grads in poor rural areas go to academic high school. All right. um, here is the high school gap in China today, or in 2005. Um, about 90, 85% uh, of urban kids go to high school, while only 40% of rural kids go to high school. Who does that look like? Does China look more like South Korea, who successfully won there? They look exactly like Mexico. Exactly like Mexico. But the only difference between Mexico and China is, well, in Mexico, this was each in one. This was 10 million. In China, it's 100 million. We're producing 100 million kids now. If you think through 2030, there's going to be another cycle, another 100 million. There's 200 million kids that perhaps are falling into this gap okay so why is high school attendance so low in china number one chinese high school is the most expensive high school of any high of any place in the world by far here are 62 countries that we did a survey on of academic of of, of tuition in college you can see china is off the chart Okay. Um, the other thing is, is there's almost no financial aid. There's supposed to be financial aid, but what all the high schools do is they take the financial aid and they build dormitories with it. Um, and so it's the, almost no kids get fine. And, and it's changing, but but that's a problem. So March 2013, the Ministry of Education, the Minister of Education in the new government came out and announced we are not going to eliminate tuition of academic high school. We will not increase enrollment of academic high school. All right. um, so what do they say? Well, we're going to keep a plan. They have a plan to expand education through vocational ed and training. So all right. they want to expand that. So the question is, let's move to Jirgao. How unequal is that? I don't have very rich data yet. We just are finishing the analysis, uh, rich analysis of this. But we went to about 150 uh, technical high schools in Zhejiang and Shanxi. And we actually found in Zhejiang, these technical high schools are not bad. Okay, the, the kids learn vocational skills. Their math, science, English, uh, Chinese are maintaining a level. They don't get any better, but they aren't getting worse. Okay, so, so vocational edge working. If we go to Shanxi and we, we randomly selected 65 VET programs in there, what we find is students are not learning anything in vocational. They aren't learning any skills, zero. All right. And their math and Chinese skills are actually deteriorating. So they come out knowing less, less math after one year. So what does that mean for these? I mean, is it really that well? The, 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 the most easy way to see the quality of these technical schools in rural areas is look at what the students do. And um, what the students, if they're not learning anything, what the students do is drop out. And so our survey, we went the first day or first week of class in October of the academic year. This was uh, two and a half years ago. And then at the end of the first academic year, we went again and we found that 22% of kids dropped out of of Jirgao in Shanxi. We just finished, it went another year, another year, we just finished year three, and we went back to the same schools. 61% of the kids left school. So kids come into Jirgao and then they leave. 
okay? Because they aren't learning anything, okay? They aren't, they aren't, uh, th those other ones are the Jojong numbers. So REAP is the, the group that I work in, Rural Education Action Project, is showing that problems uh, uh, are, are actually starting before upper secondary school. So upper secondary school, it's hard to access uh, if you're poor because of high tuition uh, and, and limited enrollment. And vocational ed's uh, the track that they're trying to push poor kids into, but they aren't learning anything out of it. Uh, so that's a problem. But we actually are showing that problems are starting before upper secondary school. Uh, so let's look at junior high education uh, at this time. Um, we went to 175 poor rural junior high schools. And we gave kids exams, uh, our, what they're called IRT scaled achievement tests. So these, we gave them a test in September, we gave them a test in June. And the, these two tests were coordinated so we could measure absolute learning. So did they learn anything? So if, if you get negative scores between the two deltas, you actually got stupider. <laughs> you, you, you forgot stuff. You, you, didn't, you had negative learning. I think that's the way to think of it. Now we took the kids the first day in class, we asked them, when you finish junior high, these are Chui, these are a grade one junior high students, we ask them, when you finish junior high, do you plan to go in the labor market? Uh, do you plan to go to vocational high school? Do you plan to go to academic high school? Have you not decided? So those are the three, four choices. And we took them there, and you can see that the kids who say, I'm gonna go to academic high school, they learn in junior high, okay? That between their first year of junior high, they have positive learning. But all the other kids in junior high don't learn anything. In fact, they regress. They know less at the end of grade seven than they knew in grade six. And that's because when you get into junior high, it's extremely large classes, about 60 to 70 kids. The teachers get rewarded for kids going to academic high school. So what they do is they quickly figure out the kids who are going to academic high school, they focus on them, and they ignore all the rest of the kids. Just to scale the numbers, what would be the achievement for a, you know, a, a, a not poor student? I, 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 I'm, I'm sorry, we, we, we I'm just... I'm trying to figure out whether 0.04 is, is small. Probably small, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now there's a big distribution around there. Right. And there's also wishful thinkers in there, right? So these are kids who, you know, I wish, my, or my mom says I'm gonna go to academic yeah. high school, but, uh, so there's, with, and, and of course there's distributions around all these things, right? Um, so it's a good question. I mean, in a lot of these things, we don't have numbers for the, we've been working in poor areas, so we often, you know, we'll have to say, what? but it is there, so it's exactly the question. So what happens in junior high, so remember this is junior high, if you aren't learning in junior high, what happens is they drop out. And here's a, here's a study um, that when we track these junior high kids over time, and 14% of them drop out in grade seven, 29% of them have dropped out by grade eight, and by the middle of grade nine, 38% of junior high kids are gone. Okay. What, what is the total population here? So this is all kids who are going, these are all kids, to, uh, if our sample's represented of poor rural areas, these are all kids who start grade one junior high school in poor rural areas. So uh, the, the number of kids who, um, uh, if there's 100 that start, uh, only 62 finish, okay? Um, of course, you know, they're a bit, China's a victim of their own success. It's not only that they aren't learning, is that wages are high and rising, right? The high, junior high is free, but there's a high opportunity cost that's arising there. Of course, when kids are dropping out in junior high today, they're the ones we find in the factories, the women in the factories. They can barely read, they can barely write, and they're really angry at the school system. I mean, this is what we've been finding. We're doing some work on counseling in these, high, in these junior highs. The kids are so angry at their teachers, they're angry at the government, they're angry at society. And, and, and I think that uh, that's something that's sort of think about the breeding grounds of transition. Okay, so how unequal, that's junior high. You know, uh, uh, why are they doing so bad in junior high? Uh, we talked a lot about the unfair resource allocation. I don't want to go into that. Actually, China's invested a lot recently in rural schools. You go to rural schools and the, the structures, the buildings aren't bad and they raise teacher salaries. Okay, so they really should be given. There's still problems 
there's still problems with um, uh, there's a, a new thing to put computer rooms in every classroom here's what you find after a couple years our favorite use of our computer rooms in these classrooms you know are, are that right? is, is we have real problems with facilities and, and, and um, but I think the real source of the problem isn't the buildings and isn't the investment into teacher salaries and training that always needs done but even if you have the best of all possible teachers and facilities if kids are sick if kids are malnourished they aren't going to be able to learn um, and so between 2008 and 2012 we've done five different studies and we've tested 60,000 children uh, for iron deficiency anemia pinshit okay so um uh in shanxi shanxi gansu qinghai ningxia sichuan guizhou and what you can see is uh, in every one of these places there's about a third of these kids are malnourished uh, this is across huge swaths of rural china and which means that up to 30 million school-aged children are estimated to be suffering from malnutrition I mean, this is this is china today I mean, this is this is not ten years ago. This is China today. That a third of these these kids are now. Luckily, CHNS just published their anemia study. Of course, CHNS is all focused on the East Coast, uh, and eight percent of kids are anemic in English. Most of those these are school age kids. Girls are a little higher than boys. That's because girls want to be skinny and pretty and they don't eat meat. And, and in the United States, there's 5% of kids are anemic, and it's almost all girls. Um, and, and so this is China's East Coast looks very much like a developed country. Huge difference uh, in the West Coast. Uh, the last thing is, is, is eyesight. Uh, Albert Park and Paul Glevy sort of motivated this whole study for us and, and showed numbers that are remarkably like this. We just finished a study of 19,000 children in Gansu and Shanxi. We tested them all and we found out that 25% of them were Jinshriya, were myopic, okay, <laughs> are nearsighted. Now that's okay, right? Nearsighted, I'm nearsighted, right? You put, and then you're not nearsighted. The problem is, is only 650 of them had glasses only about three percent or one in eight eight kids can't see the board and one of them uh, only has glasses so seven of them don't and in these classrooms what happens is they either they either seat them by height okay and so it has no or they put the best students in front and of course if you're nearsighted you aren't the best student so you can put in back which makes the, the, the problem all the more problem and then we've just finished a study of testing about 5,000 kids for intestinal worms. Um, uh, so here's test, you know, 60,000 anemia studies, 5,000 worms. Uh, that's because intestinal worms is much, much uh, less romantic um, uh, there. And what we find is, is that a three to five year old kids, 34% of them are, have worms in their stomach, right? 41% of kids in school, in Guizhou schools today, uh, this, we, st we finished this study uh, seven days ago. So that's, uh, today in Guizhou, 42% of eight to 10 year olds uh, have, have worms. So the last thing is infants and toddlers. This is, I mean, this is definitely motivated by, by Jim's work who said, you know, it's nothing but preschool. <laughs> you know, and so, exactly. Uh, and, and of course, uh, Lumai and his group uh, uh, really sort of, I think, has been at the forefront of, of bringing this problem uh, uh, to the forefront. They were in one area of Qinghai, and so we've just finished a study of uh, uh, testing a thousand moms and their babies in, in 21 counties in, in Shanxi, in southern Shanxi, all in the Qingli Mountains. These are all Han, okay? So every, there's almost no minority uh, in this group. Uh, this is two hours from Xi'an, right? Great roads, but it's, it's uh, and this is what we found. Um, 948 babies tested. 556 of them had anemia rates below HB levels below 110. All right. Um, uh, another 22 percent of them had HBs between 110 and 120, so mild anemia. So basically, 82 percent of babies. Remember, this is 
China's future labor force, right? 82% of them aren't getting the nutrition they need. Interestingly, only 20% of them were stunted. Okay, so what that really is telling us that it's really a micronutrient problem. They're getting plenty of jusher, they're getting plenty of, 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 of rice, and, and they're, getting, they're breastfeeding uh, from their mothers probably way too long, uh, but they aren't getting any other uh, nutritional supplements uh, or any other uh, uh, a balanced diet. Uh, we actually gave them a test um, of baby nutrition and pig nutrition, Yangzhu, right? So pig nutrition, and, and they do much, much, much better on pig nutrition than they do on baby nutrition. And, and, uh, and of course, you know, they have many litters of pigs, but they only have one or two babies, right? So, I mean, it's, it's a really a, a serious informational problem. Um, so what are the cognitive consequences to these 948 babies? Uh, we gave them uh, IQ tests, okay? They're called Bailey's tests. Um, these Bailey tests were really hard to give because you, you, you do things like show baby a picture, uh, you, you, you show baby a picture and then you score it, right? If, if, if he just stares at it, they get zero. You know, if they reach at it and want to grab it, you get three. And that's what babies should do. Uh, and then you know, there's ten steps. There's ten, ten different little exercises. You get to step nine, and it takes an hour to do, except when at step nine they, the baby gets hungry. And they poops and then nurses and then falls asleep and the newborn has to wait for two hours till the baby wakes up and then you finish. It's, it was really a hard, hard, hard uh, study to do. Uh, what we found though was actually shocking is that 70% of infants in China failed their infant IQ tests. Okay? That they were below the cutoff that said that they're, they're handicapped. Subnormal cognition, subnormal motor skills. Uh, by the way, we're, we're also, we did some scales uh, Dr. Moon was really good at giving us some uh, non-cognitive scales. We don't have those data yet, but they're being entered. Uh, the, the Bailey scores, you get them immediately because uh, they're scored right, score right there. So the ultimate consequence is if micronutrient deficiencies of infants and toddlers aren't corrected before baby is 30 months old, we know there's lifetime effects on IQ, mental health, height, weight, and health. Um, what does this mean? Well, in harshest terms, if those kids don't get well nourished, between 20 to 30 percent of China's future population are in danger of becoming permanently, physically, and mentally handicapped. Okay, now, what does that mean? It doesn't mean that they're handicapped. It means that they're going to have an IQ of 90 or an IQ of 93. You know, and, and grandma, who's taking care of baby, right? I mean, grandma says, ah, I'm feeding, my, I'm feeding this baby like I fed my baby, right? And like my mom fed me. And of course, it's probably okay if you're a subsistence farmer if you have an IQ of 92 or 93. You follow a cow back and forth, right? I mean, and, and maybe, maybe you're a better farmer than somebody with an IQ of 120. Right? But if you want to know, you can't learn math, science, plus all the non-cognitive skills that probably are going to come along with, with this and, and we're going to see soon. So, so I think this is, is really super. So final summary and conclusions. Inequality today among the highest in the world, uh, high, upper quintile. Human capital, I mean, very unequal education, very unequal nutrition, very unequal health. I mean, I think, does this mean that tomorrow, now, you know, inequality, uh, income inequality, if it comes down, but I think we're talking, it, even if overall inequality comes down, we're worried about the capabilities of this part of the population to participate in this modern industrial China. So the summary of China's development experience in the past 30 years, they've had success with growth, but it's come at the cost of this great inequality, okay, high income inequality. The fact is that we know growth is going to slow. Um, you know, if, if China follows the Japan route, it's going to go to zero. But at the best, by 2030, it's going to be 2% or 3%. Um, unlike the patterns of growth of countries that successfully graduated, like the Japans, the Taiwans, the South Korea, the Ireland, that went from uh, uh, middle income to high income, had growth with equity, China's on this path 
looks like an Argentina or a Brazil or a Chile or a Mexico today. Um, this is growth with high inequality. And so can China address this issue? Um, growth will slow. What can they really do about income inequality? Um, we, we talked about that, short run. You know, I think the, the bigger inequalities out there are market driven and, and there's, there are some policies that can do it, but I think um, they can't do anything about today's, <laughs> uh, today's in, inequality. It's a fact. I think the main intervention we can talk about is investment heavily today in human capital for everyone. And I think there's a lot you can do. You called for, that, that there's a call for a program evaluation to figure out what works. We've actually shown in randomized control trials that vitamins work. Albert shown that eyeglasses have worked. Uh, Deworming works. Early childhood education works. Computer room software teachers work. Conditional cash transfer, junior high students, counseling program. These things work, okay? So the question is, the question, I'm gonna skip, skip over this. Uh, and you can see that, that when you give a kid a vitamin a day, their nutrition goes up, their health improves, and their math test scores go up. If you give them a, a computer assisted learning program, their test scores go up, their Chinese goes up, their math goes up. So the question is, in, in conclusion, is can China afford this? They have better classrooms, better teachers, better curriculum, they need better. What does it take to do all this? I know the afternoon session is gonna be talking about the, the fiscal problem, and I think that that's where it resolves. You know, because you, you show all these leaders in poor areas and they go, Fund it, we'll do it, right? But we don't have any of our own fiscal resources. I think it's actually to do these types of things, to send every kid to high school uh, for free, uh, all the way to send every kid to preschool for free, um, it, it can be done in three ways. If China would just keep its promise to spend 4% of its budget on education, if they reallocated half of the moon budget, right? China's going to the moon in 2020. I think that's great. It's great. I like China going to the moon. Why don't we take it and move it to 2030? Right? Move that to 2030, take half the budget and spend it. You can fund all this stuff with it. Then when China gets to the moon, they'll still have a vibrant, stable uh, uh, economy. Uh, the last thing is to allocate all increases of fiscal funds today on, right? Don't displace any current programs. Uh, I, I know. So what if China can't overcome this big human capital challenge? Uh, what happens if two distinct classes grow, the haves and the have-nots, and China's growth slows, right? What happens if there's 20 mil 200 million unemployed? You remember, if there's 200 million unemployed, 80 million are going to be unmarried, right? There's going to be... 80 million unmarried, unemployed, unemployable bachelors out there. And I mean, I th what do they do? They can't go to the United States, right? There's no border. So they're either gonna go into the informal economy where there's no benefits and no wages, or they could go into organized crime. And does organized crime ever happen in China? Every single, as you guys know, right? Every single, China invented organized crime. Um, so I hope we can choose optimism. I think there is enough time starting now, but I think the time is now, the clock's ticking. I hope that this new secret inequality program, you know, does all this stuff and more. So thank you very much. First discussion is uh, Albert Clark. That's always a hard act to follow, um, and it's also uh, very challenging to give discussing comments for your former dissertation supervisor. But I guess the good part about that is if I don't do a good job, I can actually blame the speaker for the inadequate training I received. Um, uh, Scott, obviously from the enormous amount of uh, rich research results that Scott has presented, the work that the rural Education Action Program is doing is extremely important. Uh, I think it's uncovering a whole wealth of issues um, that have not been well understood in China and so has uh, incredible uh, policy relevance. 
Um, I have. Um, But in the, so let me summarize. Um, uh, the, the presentation actually is much broader and covered a lot more ground than the paper. Uh, and the paper, I'm gonna, I'm gonna speak, um, I think a lot of my comments will, will address all of it, but um, the, the paper focuses on uh, really two big parts. The first part is this country level analysis uh, that tries to motivate the importance of having low inequality and high levels of education for countries to escape the middle income trap. And uh, they're kind of developed case studies of Korea and Mexico, which Scott went into. And then the second part uh, brings it back to China and asks this question about can the human capital of China's workers support the higher wages that uh, look to be coming very, very quickly uh, in China's labor market. And a uh, secondary question here that gets a lot of attention is why is there such a big urban-rural gap in performance? Um, and then the paper talks about uh, education and about uh, some of the nutrition work that Reef has been doing in the area of anemia and intestinal worms. Um, and just to recap, for uh, there's a lot of emphasis that Scott uh, puts uh, on, on high school education as being a really critical factor and he argues that the reason uh, that there's a lack of upper secondary schooling in poor regions of China is number one, there are high costs, number two, there's high opportunity costs, and number three, there's competitiveness of high school uh, and college entrance, meaning that there are only a limited number of spots. So even if kids wanted to go, uh, only a limited number can go. Okay, now I wanna talk a little about each of these parts. And in the spirit of the many open conversations we've had over the years, uh, I want spare any punches either. Um, I think that overall this paper sketches out a, a really big picture argument starting from, from the macro kind of uh, cross-country comparisons and brings it down to the very, very micro level. Um, and it sketches this kind of argument because there's a lot of, um, it's, it's so ambitious that necessarily there are a lot of missing pieces connecting the various parts. I think the most convincing part and I think very uncontroversial part is the micro evidence that provides compelling evidence that the government should be doing something, which is the conclusion that Scott ends on. But let me go through some of the pieces. Um, so for the analysis of the middle income track and the importance of low inequality, high education, uh, Scott groups uh, sets of countries world to the ones that have made it and the ones who are aspiring but haven't made it. It wasn't completely clear to me how the 13 aspiring countries were chosen, those ones with a very high um, uh, Gini coefficients, so it would be helpful to, to discuss that a bit more. And uh, it's really a descriptive motivation. Uh, since there are a number of uh, countries in the data set, it would be helpful, I think, to put this into a multivariate analysis, at least at the, at the level of correlations, we can really understand, in particular, uh, distinguishing among uh, the role of inequality of income, which is really the Gini coefficients, versus inequality of education, which is obviously a different um, aspect of inequality, and also the overall level of education, which seems important to the argument in the background, but it's not clear how it relates necessarily to inequality, especially in explaining national level outcomes of growth. So here are the big missing piece as well, in terms of just conceptually and thinking about how this relates to uh, how to think about the problems of China, is what are really the mechanisms, even across countries, that relate this income inequality to escaping the middle income trap. Now, is it the demand side? Are there a lot of, of course, a rich literature about this that looks at the role of income distribution and how it affects the structure of demand and that how that structure of demand uh, is important for generating growth at different levels of development given the, kind of the uh, usual pattern of structural change in the economy. There's a lot of work about governance that inequality leads to um, certain types of rent-seeking or inability to uh, converge on common goals. Um, and here, the emphasis is all about skills. And, uh, but here, too, we need to think clearly about how does the skill distribution really affect the overall growth of the economy. And I'll come back to this. I'm, I'm going to develop this as we, go talk, as we kind of talk about China. Okay, so let, let me talk about the middle income trap in China as it's motivated. So, one question I had 
So, so the argument um, or the motivation for thinking about uh, human capital inequality is that this is a key constraint to escaping the middle income trap in China. But my first comment, of course, is that there's lots of other things that matter for escaping the middle income trap. And I think if you look at, for instance, the China, 20, um, uh, China 2030 report that DRC wrote with uh, World Bank last year, it's a major focus, escaping the middle income trap. Uh, there's a little bit of attention to skills, but most of the attention is really on raising productivity, thinking about switching to uh, being able to innovate and create a domestic innovation system. I know Scott's done work on that too, and has a lot of facts about that, saying that there, there, there are challenges. Um, but even if we go back to the cases of Mexico and Korea, it's not clear whether the difference in performance of those two economies are related to uh, the skill distribution as opposed to other things that are generating uh, demand for skills. So, of course, if you have educated workers and you want to employ them all, you need to be creating, you need to be shifting to higher level um, technologies, you need to be upgrading technologies, uh, both in industry and in services, and that comes back to investments and capital and the innovation I talked about before, which perhaps is the most important aspect of raising labor productivity, which is going to support high wages, uh, whether it be for skilled workers or unskilled workers. So that's all kind of missing, I think, in thinking about um, uh, what China needs to escape the milk trap. And I think those may be uh, as important or maybe even more important in China's kind of um, uh, 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 prospects for uh, maintaining its growth momentum into the next 20 or 30 years. Now, I don't think Scott would necessarily degree, disagree with that, but I just want to put that out that, there to kind of put this in proper perspective. Um, if we think about the supply of skills, and this is what Scott focuses on in the presentation in the paper, uh, I think there is this very interesting uh, contrast or um, trade-off between uh, trying to address short-term incentives versus long-term incentives. Uh, so, uh, Scott points out that a lot of kids face a high opportunity cost now because you can get a pretty high wage in the labor market, and this may prevent you from getting uh, more training or more education, which actually might serve you better in the long run. Right? And of course, that could be compounded if there are credit constraints and other things that push kids to uh, take the, kind of the, 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 the early cash as opposed to making longer uh, term investments. Um, but it's not just the quality of skills, it's also the quality of skills. So, for instance, I think there are very difficult questions about kind of matching the skill training in the economy on the supply side to the current demand needs and the future demand needs. So we can talk about vocational education in this context. There are certainly shortages. Uh, there's a lot of discussion recently about skill mismatch in the labor market. There's certainly shortage of certain types of technical workers and managerial workers in China. And of course, you could try to design a hopefully improved vocational education system that allowed uh, current young people to take advantage of those more immediate job opportunities by easing these um, skill mismatches. But of course, in the long run, the best advice you could probably give a young person today is go to college if you can, because 20, 30 years from now, I imagine the returns to having uh, made that investment are gonna be enormous, right? And um, so how do you trade those things off? Um, there is this issue of vocational versus regular education, and, and Scott uh, you know, shows that in poor areas, the vocational uh, system is not performing very well. One way to maybe ease this, these trade-offs is to try to think about blending the content of education so that even when you have uh, vocational training programs, include a general education component, which provides students with those basic skills that, sh that Scott show are deteriorating. <coughs> deteriorating. Um, and puts them in a position not only to capture some of the near-term employment opportunities, but gives them enough of a basis so that we can think about more lifetime learning models where they, if the economy changes, they're able to adapt and retrain. And employers are also able to retrain. I think there needs to be a lot of thinking in the Chinese labor market about uh, the role of public education, uh, which Scott emphasizes, but also private opportunities for private education um, and for employers themselves, how, what are the roles that each, part, each party needs to play in the overall skill training in the economy that can both meet the immediate needs of the economy and also the long-term needs. Um, so I'm gonna 
But one other thing I wanted to say is that um, about uh, the labor market here is that in terms of the middle income trap, it doesn't seem to me that compelling that if there is a, a relatively small percentage of the labor force that is low skilled, low productivity, that this is, is going to necessarily drag the entire economy down. If you think about innovation and these other things, that's probably going to be driven by people with, um, with the high levels of human capital. Right. Of course, it's going to create inequality, and it's, which could create many tensions and challenges. But in terms of undermining overall growth, I think uh, economy as large and rich as China has certainly a room for a great diversity of skill levels, where uh, where there's going to be a demand for people of those different skills. So I think again, it's a challenge to link it back uh, to the, these growth arguments. Okay. Um, how much time do I have? I'm going. I don't want to take, let me go to the last point then. Oh, oh, this is the last slide, okay, good. I thought I had another one. Um, so, I just want to focus on this last thing. Um, so, okay, so the last part of the paper gets really into the micro evidence on health and um, its impact on learning and the prevalence of all of these problems. I think nobody uh, outside or inside China realized were such big problems prevalence of anemia, of intestinal worms, etc. Um, now, one challenge uh, of, of, of generalizing from the studies that REAP has done is that there does seem to be a lot of intraprovincial variation in the prevalence of these things. And the surveys have typically been done only in a couple, two or three places. So it's not that easy to know what the whole picture is in China, but it certainly raises enough questions to suggest the country should be trying to find out the overall health situation uh, with respect to these things. And hopefully this work will motivate that. Um, but then I think the other thing that uh, would be nice to kind of draw the links together to the big argument is to uh, bring in more what are the, the impacts on the test score gap, which gets a lot of attention in the paper from the prevalence. So I know there's some evidence on the effect of anemia on test scores. Uh, of course, there's going to be the, these immediate, there's less evidence, I think, on worms. Even the worms work that Michael Kramer has done on test scores, it affects attendance and, and other things. Uh, but the other thing, of course, is that we really need to think of these problems in a dynamic context. These early, these problems that occur early in childhood or in primary school will lead to accumulated effects over time. Even if the immediate effects are not as large, it's going to be complementary to other types of abilities, learning, and reinforcing investments. Which, and so we really need to understand better what the longer term effects are of these initial uh, <laughs> deficits. And so that's the value of following up. So I hope Scott, uh, who Reap is planning to do, continue to follow uh, children along many of these interventions, these exciting interventions that they've done. And finally, I think the take home point, I think really from Scott's presentation should be that there are these huge issues that uh, where very cost-efficient investments are going to have huge returns <coughs> in terms of establishing a basis of human capital, and I don't think they should. I think they should be relatively uncontroversial. Um, and there are things that the government really needs to address. And as Scott showed, China is a very rich country. It's certainly something that they can do. So, thank you. Okay, well, I, uh, I will make some comments that are complimentary to what Albert just said, and uh, let me just uh, extend my uh, congratulations to Scott. Uh, he's, of course, done a tremendous amount of work, and uh, in the earlier presentations here at the Senate, talked a lot and helped clarify the nature of inequality. I would be a little bit worried, however, about the, uh, uh, the initial correlation you put up. I mean, it has a property, I mean, it's like, there are a lot of these relationships, uh, in this case, the relationship between inequality and growth. I mean, some people have reversed that. <laughs> and uh, there's a huge discussion where the dependent variable is reversed. Uh, so we know that the, that kind of correlational evidence itself is a little bit dangerous. And, and, and as Albert was suggesting, and as I think Scott would, uh, would agree with, that we really need to go, dig deeper into understanding exactly what that relationship is. And in particular, I was troubled, as I think Albert was, and maybe some of you, the rest of you were, about the notion of the parallel of Mexico 
and the whole question about well, well, Mexico we know has kind of had a starts and falls. So I, I have done some work in Mexico. I have looked at it. And so the question is, in what sense can we use? We try to dig more deeply and sort of use Mexico as a paradigm. And we think about uh, what what went wrong in Mexico and what might go right and what the policy issues are. Oops. Sorry. <laughs> Very loud right here. It's <laughs> <laughs> interesting that we actually have a very big signal on it. So. No, but I think one one component. So there are certain aspects that are in common, and I think it might be useful, Scott, in the revision and the thinking down the road about what aspects uh, would be in common in a broader context, not just the human capital component, which is a, which is a part of it. I mean, there is a sense in which both China and Mexico have a shortfall in human capital. Because it is the case that unskilled workers now, both in, both in the United States, because of the United States market, and in China because of the East Coast uh, market relative to what, what, the, uh, what the West uh, uh, provides, that unskilled workers have very substantial opportunity costs about working. And in the case of the United States, it's been, uh, and, and Mexico, it's been well studied that opportunities in the United States have actually discouraged acquisition of skill. You can go to the United States, get a pretty good job, a much higher job than you can, a much better paying job, actually, in the United States uh, at a very low level of education than you, than you, than you stay in Mexico uh, with, a, with a high school or even college degree. So there really is a sense. But it then leads to the question of why exactly the wage payments to education is so low, which is a point that Albert is making, and I think we really have to look at more broadly what it is that causes uh, markets not to be as efficient in, in sort of pricing skills, uh, especially providing skill incentives for acquisition of long-term skills. And in particular, in Mexico, there is a major difference with China, and that is the inflexibility of the labor market. There's a very high level of regulation, which has been absent in China. I know there are discussions for taking sort of Western European type, type standards, but since the revolution in Mexico, there's been very tight labor market regulation which has actually distorted incentives and I think has had a huge role. I'll come back to that incentive issue. So in that sense, I don't know if the Mexican case is, 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 is going to apply directly. But I would, in, in, in just seconding a point of previous discussion, think about what it is that certainly gives rise in you know, capital investment, aspects of productivity, and in fact, uh, aspects, for example, of corruption and state monopolies, which I think are common I think, between Mexico and, uh, and, and China. But I think that uh, analogy should be pursued a little, little deeper and maybe looking at various components. So that's one point I'd like to make. A second point I'd like to talk about is really the issue that, again, Albert talked about, I just alluded to briefly, but I want to expand on a little bit. And that is integrating the labor market with the supply of education. I think it's the case that uh, in middle level skills, China has not been that adequate in really kind of aligning the skills, especially of the foreign domestic, or the foreign, uh, foreign firms coming in, looking for skilled workers and aligning the demands of skills for those workers with the supplies of skills of the educational system. And I think one of the paradigms that's actually you could borrow from the United States has been this cooperation between firms and uh, business uh, uh, and, and, and state education systems, where state education systems have actually adapted rather well in providing services, and firms have played a role in supplying some of the education, uh, and therefore uh, solving some of the questions about educational finance, because the firms themselves have tremendous interest in sort of uh, building uh, and training schools. So, for example, even in Chicago, uh, we have a close cooperation, even, even now, with uh, General Motors and local community colleges, in training workers in the General Motors system and in training them in the, in the various skills needed, providing partial subsidy, but also General Motors gains real advantage in actually providing that integration. Now, more generally, there's an appeal that could be made to uh, uh, other uh, 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 societies, for example, the German apprenticeship system, the Swiss apprenticeship system, the Austrian system. There are some recent evaluations of those where, again, you're integrating the market uh, the demand for market and sort of motivating uh, students to learn market relevant skills uh, and making the educational system actually much more responsive because of that. So it breaks down the separation between, uh, between education. In the United States, we have a disastrous job training system that's strictly governmental. 
I mean, we have cases where simply because of limitations in, in, in funding and maybe limitations in imagination, that the curriculum being provided in a lot of the job training programs has very little to do with market realities. That, of course, gets eliminated when firms are providing the training. They can argue, well, that could be too narrow. And that's where there could be some cooperation between firms and, uh, and, 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 and governments, because there is a general education component that firms would have no interest in financing, but a specific component that they do have and would have. And so there are examples, even the economic development of, a, of, of, a, of, a, of the backward region of South Carolina 40, 50 years ago occurred because of this symbiosis of market and firm. So that's one, another issue. Now something that's going to be discussed this afternoon, so I don't want to steal the thunder, but I would just raise a point about decentralization and again, sort of asking why it is we get these large regional inequalities. You'll notice a lot of these people in the west or in the central area where you're getting uh, uh, really very, uh, from the point of view of, even an American point of view, I think about this, where we do have a lot of regional inequality. The regional inequality in China seems very, very striking. I think it's partly because there's less transfer from the center, right? There's much greater fiscal decentralization. I don't know, Dalai, you would know this better. They're going to talk further about this this afternoon. But I think the question is, again, thinking about alternative policies, why resources are not reaching these poor rural areas? Why there isn't a greater equalization of funds? And now, of course, the immigration policy is one example. That's much discussed. We've heard about that already. But it seems like there's also some, a lot of role for funds from the center to provide, actually, resources. Uh, and also the issue about tuition. I mean, it's, it's, it, it, again, it's going to show up again in a, in a paper that will be discussed this afternoon. When we look at the uh, relationship, the intergenerational immobility, really, which seems to be rising in China, uh, the tuition policy, in particular in the, in the uh, secondary schools uh, and higher, seems to be extremely uh, strange. And you showed a great graph, and I think that's an interesting question. But it also points out more generally that the supply of funds, again, the question about credit market imperfections more general. I mean, in principle, you could have people borrowing uh, for those very high tuitions. So, no, I mean, I'm not arguing that that's necessarily the best. But given the kind of rates of return that have been shown on these different levels of education, there seems to be an inefficiency there. So it's a different margin on which one could operate about looking at credit markets, thinking more generally about how lending and borrowing might be provided. Uh, it's not obvious, although it, it is obvious if you sort of look at previous examples and, and certainly the graphs got put up about the two direct uh, tuitions paid. In fact, the tuition is a ratio of family income. It's extremely high. It's not just the absolute level of tuition. It's at what it could be half or more than half of the family income for poor rural Chinese. So again, that would link back to the decentralization on opening up of, of credit markets or some opening up of finance by either transfers or some kind of notion of private finance. So let me just conclude with the notion, uh, it's sort of the point that you've talked about a lot of different policies. You have short-term evaluations of these policies. I think it's useful. If you look at the example in countries where we have done long-term evaluations, Mary Young is here, you know, we have studies, follow-ups of nutritional interventions in Jamaica and so forth. They're showing very substantial rates of return. So suggesting that the policies that Scott's recommending would have a very, very high rate of return. But I think the a, a general uh, notion that might be thought of, especially as, as an advice for, for uh, study of policy, is to try to come up with a framework where we are computing rates of return, at least at a minimum. Some notion where we can make prioritizations among these competing policies. I mean, the danger is always to say, we seem to have very high return here, high return here, the short run returns, as, as Albert said. We certainly want to collect long-term longitudinal data and so forth. But I think we also can build up a framework of evaluation. But I think we want to put this in a framework for understanding exactly what the mechanisms are, even of the human capital policy. Just which of those are going to be effective, in what way they're going to actually, uh, they're going to sort of go uh, and, and, oops, and expand the uh, uh, structure of, uh, of opportunity. So I think, uh, I think uh, you've, you've covered a range of questions, but in terms of the larger goals of the conference, I would try to plug your paper in to say exactly how did this condition come into existence. You know, Maybe make the analogies. I'm not sure the list of 13 is the right list, but I would make the list partly in the sense of which of those countries have some of the very same conditions, both political 
in, in market conditions that make them uh, possibly stagnant and, and possibly pose a, as a paradigm for what future uh, developments might be in China. But I, but I do think that, uh, that, that the opportunities are, are, are substantial. Uh, I think that the opportunities for collecting data and trying to evaluate data and to think about some of these deeper questions about exactly what are the sources of inequality. I have no doubt from the evidence that uh, the early life conditions are important, but the remediation programs in the, in the later life are also potentially quite important. And especially when you think about a transitional policy, I think you'd want to also focus on that. So I, I was missing in, in the current draft, in the current discussion, any kind of prioritization about you know, these competing policies. Should we be spending, or should China be spending much of its resources in early life conditions? Should it be primarily spending its, uh, its, its resources? So if we were to say with a fixed budget, where would we prioritize? Would the highest return be in tuition reduction, for example? Or would it be in deworming or in providing iron supplements? I think that's an open question. But it's not just true of China, it's true of many development strategies around the world. So thank you very much. I think it's a very stimulating paper. storyteller when I get to the macro. <laughs> <laughs> I find it even foreboding to think this. But uh, if there are people who are interested in this, uh, I'm certainly looking for collaborators to do something seriously with um, uh, other aspiring countries and try to take those um, uh, analogies further. Uh, that's not my comparative advantage. And I didn't want it. It seemed like it might have distracted more than it helped focus. <laughs> and, 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 yeah, yeah, that's right. So, but, but the others, I mean, I think the, the issues of rates of return are absolutely central, and it's very hard to do and it's, uh, and because you need short and long run uh, uh, impact. Why, and, why and, and, yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, um, and, and a, because you have to, you know, basically the, it doesn't exist. Um, if you, very interestingly, when we intervene in nutritional studies in schools, we always find a positive impact on uh, educational performance. That actually hardly happens anywhere in the world. You, you often, you do nutrition programs and it gets kids into school, but there's no effect on education. So then, uh, if you want to try to get the long run benefits of this, you have to figure out yourself rather than going to the literature and, and figure out. So I think that that's another, um, I think, just call that we need uh, collaboration and uh, uh, to do these long term dynamic cost benefit studies and, and put them in the literature. It's things we've struggled with, and, and uh, I, I think you've just sort of put that higher on, on the agenda of things that we've done. a couple of questions, Richard. Uh, my my question is probably related to the uh, to the regional and the, the both the fiscal system between center and local, but also um, the personnel policies of local and provincial appointments. There is very little incentive in China at the local and provincial levels for government officials to actually place any interest in developing health and education. Uh, indeed, um, under Zhu Rongji, uh, they privatized education uh, and let markets determine fees for tuition. And uh, health care is abysmal. Uh, from what we know is that uh, the state provides only 10% of hospital uh, expenditures and the hospital raises the other 90% uh, without insurance schemes of any sort uh, uh, in place. Um, so, uh, so un un unless uh, you know the, uh, the the fiscal as well as the uh, incentives 
uh, for uh, local public officials to be focused on those issues. We are all interested in, in doing quote, economic, unquote, activities rather than social activities. Uh, you know, whether this could be changed. Uh, so it's, it's rather different from a uh, other developed economies, the way the incentives of officials are uh, facing. So would you address that? Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I think that, yeah, I think that it's a matter of, I mean, Jim raised it right up here about the effects of deep, sort of extreme or very high levels of decentralization. We, we find this all the time in, in our budget. And, and it's basically, you're right, right? Because if you spend your limited amount of local fiscal resources on health, education, and, uh, and nutrition, what happens? You stimulate the flow of people outside to your, your local economy and they never come back. I mean, th this was a problem in the US, right? I mean, basically the Kennedy Johnson war on poverty, you know, finally said, we need to take this to the central government, right? Because the, the, because local governments in the U.S. even as late as the 1950s and in 60s weren't investing in health, education, nutrition, right? And so this is, and we're a very decentralized country too. So um, I think that 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 probably is at the heart of the problem. But do you think that the more democracy at the local level would provide an answer? In other words, would it be? I mean, some people have argued. Right? I'm just asking. Yeah, so, I'm not yeah, yeah, and so, so how do you, right. Um, I mean, um, more elected officials that be more responsible in some sense, maybe more interested in education. So we had, in the U.S., we had elected officials, right, in, in poor Mississippi. southern right. Mississippi counties, and right. that they didn't invest in, in nutrition education because they were so poor, right? And, 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 and they were racist. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 well, there's also and there's a lot. And there's a lot. And there's a lot. Yes, that's and there's a lot of and there's a lot of racism. There's a lot of racism in in the minority areas also, right? right. Like, but that they participated more. I'm, I'm just asking as a question. Whether or not, some people have advocated that, and I'm just asking maybe the audience, you. <coughs> yeah, I mean, um, is that an alternative? If I would say, should we focus on developing a transfer program with targeted transfers? Uh, or focus the debate on democracy versus, uh, I mean, I think we, we probably need to figure out the fiscal problem. Uh, my feeling is if you had an active local uh, participatory system, it would solve some problems and not them all, right? Um, you know, yeah, it's a complex example. It would cause more problems. Who would throw the function and all have to be Right. Yeah, yes, I like your presentation very much. Do you know why? Because I borrowed some slides from your presentation, from my lecture. <laughs> so, uh, about the uh, middle income curve, something called the uh, income equality. Uh, I have two questions. First is that you mentioned there is still huge in, in quality of education. But if you look at over time, it is. Uh, Increasing or decreasing in the The first question, the second is that you mentioned that there are some of the students in the, in the junior school drop up about 40% something like that in you know, the prior They have given the large number of the students in the prior <coughs> That means about uh, almost uh, five or ten million yes. with a job out. So they are job out when they are 13 years old or something like that. They should go to the labor market. They don't have some data on the child labor. So when they still learn to child labor in the uh, industrial or something like that, to you know, the economy's public. Large yeah, I mean, uh, so is it getting worse? Um, I think it's in some aspects it's getting better. I mean, that as incomes go up, nutrition is going to get better. I mean, um, 
So trying to put this in international context, and that's very interesting, is I have a table I'm writing another paper on about nutritional status of children and other vulnerable populations, uh, women, pregnant women, um, and, and toddlers, uh, and this comes from um, uh, the World Food Program. Actually, China looks good in terms of micronutrient deficiencies on a macro level compared to Brazil, where 50% of school-age kids uh, are, are still, uh, as of 2003, by the way, it's 10 years old, but 2003, 50% of Brazilian kids were uh, uh, anemic. Um, same was true in Colombia, Mexico, Costa Rica, there was a, a, a number of others. So um, that China has improved, it's you know, absolutely true. And I think there's a lot of the reasons is the structure of the economy, that everybody has land. Um, but it's stubbornly low. And, and it's not only going to be, it doesn't always get solved by income rising. You know, because China is, what is like other middle income countries, Incomes are going up. That's the good news. Bad news is institutions haven't developed. So you go to these families and say, you should buy your kids glasses. You should buy your kids vitamins. You should feed them meat. You should uh, give them deworming medicine. You should take them for... And then the, the parents say, and you say, you, you have wages are up, agriculture prices are up, uh, subsidies are up. You have money. And then they say, but... I need to build a house for my son to get him married. I need to worry about catastrophic illnesses. I need to, so there's lots of more competing demands on their funds. And that's, you know, the, the Esther, I think the best thing of Esther Flo and Banerjee's book is the characterization of the great demands on the fi fi financial resources. That's why I think it's a problem with the state. Right. So is it getting worse? Um, at the lower levels, I think it's probably getting a little bit better, but you see 82% anemia rates among infants, it's still, how could it be much better? Junior highs, it's worse. We see it's increasing dropout rates, and I think that's, that is, Albert characterized it so well, right? It's this disconnect, right, between incentives for investing in long-term uh, human capital and the short-run gains from leaving. Um, if you look at who drops out, it's boys, poor performing, um, and uh, what, I forget what the third one is. A poor. So if you're poor, if you're a boy, or if you're underachieving, because you know you aren't going to make it through this competitive system, you drop out. Families keep their girls from, from dropping out. So actually, you know, there's a 55 to 45 boy to girl ratio in primary schools. By the time you hit junior high, it's 50-50, or even there's more girls than there's boys because the boys have dropped out at a higher rate. I think that's getting worse. Okay, that, that'll be uh, the uh, last question. We have a time constraint, Scott.